Sir. Hey, John. Thanks uh, for your uh, great podcast marathon at the AFS uh, the other day. That was, that was pretty great. So one thing you didn't mention is the Lou Reed covers EP. Oh, yeah. I forgot. Uh, Correct. Um, so I understand that those, that's a brilliant album. I'm waiting for the hard copy, but I've, been, I've got the download. It's on uh, Spotify as well as other places, yeah. right? Yes, yeah, three songs. So I understand it's for, uh, to help your mother out, the yeah. proceeds, but can you talk a little bit about why Lou Reed, who is my favorite uh, recording artist, and maybe whatever relationship you had with him when he was alive? Lou came to see Hedvig off-Broadway, and as did David Bowie. <laughs> Um, and a lot of our heroes. And David didn't stay, but he actually financed a later production. But well, he also felt like an inspiration in some respects, yes. right? Yes. Lou yeah. and David were our godfathers of for the piece, you know. Also Patti Smith, John Lennon, there were, you know, Nico. Um, but maybe Lou most of all, uh, because Stephen and I loved him so much. And so when he came to the show, it was just probably the most powerful you know, person who came in our minds, and he came upstairs, six floors up to the dr dressing room, which was in a, a tower in this old hotel that the Titanic survivors stayed at. And he just looked at me, I'm like half melted makeup, and he's like, you were beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and I could have just died. And uh, so uh, later I, I'd run into him, uh, and he was always sweet. And, and Laurie Anderson, who came that night too, who didn't say anything, but later I became good friends with. And so there was a Lou Reed day at Lincoln Center. She asked me to sing, and they offered me uh, Turning Time Around, which is from a later album of his. Uh, and I interpolated the second coming from Yeats into it, you know, and so it became a kind of post-apocalyptic, which is, of course, how we all feel now. It's pre-apocalyptic. But um, so we, I did it with a band called Eyelids in Portland recently. And then we did I Found a Reason for both events. And then I'm like, let's do another one. Let's do a little out, you know, a little EP. Yeah. Uh, Chris Lucerenko, who did the Hedvig tribute album, Wig in a Box, was the head of the band, the Eyelids. And we're doing a gig this weekend in Athens, Georgia. You're playing um, out with Eyelids. Yeah. Great. And Peter Buck from REM produced the EP and will be playing with us. That's great. Yeah. So it was a dream to be able And we, I chose, my boyfriend um, worked for Lou briefly as a bass tech and teleprompter guy. It's funny to see Lou with the t walk on the wild. What is it? Walk on, <laughs> turn it. Walk on the wild side. <laughs> doot to do. Keep turning. <laughs> That that <laughs> right there that image. made the whole thing work. <laughs> uh, That's great. So and, and Jack passed away sadly uh, um, in 2004, and his favorite album was The Blue Mask, which was Lou's sobriety album. So for Jack, I sang the most painful song that Jack loved on there, which is called Waves of Fear, which is about the DTs, you know, right. getting off. And it's a very powerful song. So we'll be doing that uh, in Athens. We'll be doing it here in Austin, February 7th at Bass Hall. Uh, so, so as part of the origin of love, you're, you're going to also do... I do other people's songs, too. Yeah. I do some, head, uh, some uh, anthem songs right. with my composer, Brian Weller. I do uh, some songs from my last film, How to Talk to Girls at Parties. Right. Uh, I sing with a a Texan, a brilliant singer named Amber Martin, who uh, who should be a star by now. She does an amazing show lately, a, a, a tribute to Bette Midler at the Baths, because she became a star from performing at the Continental Gay Baths right, in the 70s right, right, right. with Barry Manilow, you know, with gut to guys in their towels. And she would do all the great songs, I Shall Be Released, Stay With Me, and, and You Gotta Have Friends, and all those songs that made her a star. And she does it sometimes to an audience in towels, you know, with fake steam made of smoke. And, uh, but the show is called Bet Bathhouse and Beyond. Oh. How great is that? So How great is good. that? So good. Bet Bathhouse. <laughs> so there's a long answer to Lou Reed. It's a good question. Yeah. A good answer. Thank you very much, and thanks for all your great work. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you. Hi. 
Hi, how are you? Um, my partner and I had the honor of uh, seeing you at the Queer Liberation March. And um, I was wondering if you could just share some wisdom. Just last and, year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Share some wisdom um, just with your vision of the future of the Pink Triangle Queer Liberation Movement versus um, like the corporate washed, almost ally washed uh, gay pride. Ally washed, I haven't heard that term, that's funny. <laughs> um, anything can be co-opted, of course. To, it's, you know, we, we didn't invent capitalism, but we, uh, we, we moved it into another realm. Uh, corporations are people. Um, <laughs> some people want to see if they can make lakes into people, trees into people, other things that need protection, right? Um, so the Queer Liberation March in New York, this last 50th Pride anniversary, was a reaction to the corporatization of the parade, which really is a series of box-like floats uh, paid for by various corporations with their employees on the box, which is fine. They had their health insurance, great, all the good, you know, the, the obvious things. But, you know, something that became missing in the queer experience is the absolute primacy of imagination and, and weirdness. And, you know, people say, keep Austin weird, and um, weird used to be a good word, you know. And, Austin's uh, kind of a, a parade with corporate-sponsored box floats. I know. These days also. I know, yeah, and the, right. the thing is, I'm, that's why I'm attracted to New Orleans, which, you know, there's still this sense of making your thing. You know, you know the, the, all the parades are so handmade and beautiful, and the, the, the beautiful mosaic of America is right there in that, in that city. Uh, maybe it's because everyone thinks it's going to be washed away. They're not investing, <laughs> you know, the city as much. I, mean, but, I think of where you're shooting uh, uh, Shrill. Portland is yeah. a city that in some ways is pre-corporate box floated. Yes, right? but it's definitely similar to Austin in that it's, it's probably the most similar city to Austin. People are a little <laughs> quieter there, I think, because it's in the cloudy area. But there is, you know, the, the prices are going up, the tech is there. Yeah, and maybe that's one thing about New Orleans that's different. Yeah, it is. Right. And um, I just, it feels like a great antidote to, to uh, New York, too. So, the, you know, I, 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 again, I grew up in, in the time of AIDS, and, and uh, the idea of resistance through creativity was everything. And... Uh, you know, my agents and stuff were like, you can't come out if you're going to be an actor because people won't cast you, you know, as a straight person. And I just was like, I couldn't, I didn't like that. You know, I just don't tell me how to, you know, if you're directing me in a scene, you can tell me what to do, but don't tell me how to live my life, you know. And uh, so I, I was galvanized. Luckily, I was the first generation, luckily, that came out at the beginning of AIDS because I knew about safe sex, you know, and uh, people a couple years older that were dying, you know, so I was, I was the first lucky generation and uh, a lot of, I think, you know, we do a party in New York called Mattachine at the oldest gay bar in New York called Julius for 12 years and we honor a different queer icon every month and uh, the idea of history for queer people is, is quite absent. You know, it's certainly not taught in schools and your family's not gonna teach you because they're not generally gay or queer. Um, so the idea of our forebears that, that died and sacrificed to, to give us what we have is, is very important. Um, while looking to the future, uh, a lot of people panicked about gay marriage who uh, were not gay. Very nice people thought it was, a, you know, going to be detrimental in some way. Actually, the person who ran the National Organization of Marriage, Maggie McGallagher, I met, was very nice. And I'm like, why is it really a problem if I get married? To, what's, how does that affect you? Uh, it was changing the definition of marriage. I was like, it might need a little change. You know, there's a certain, with the divorce rates and the, you know, maybe there needs to be a broadening of the idea of what marriage can be. And sometimes same-sex uh, couples and trans marriages and all kinds, you know, are changing the definition for the better, i.e. people have sometimes fallen into gender, you know, roles. I'm the woman in the marriage, therefore I do this. I'm the man, therefore I must, you know, be the breadwinner. And it's like, 
and ideas of monogamy, all of these things which were received wisdom have been kind of expanded by queer marriage, you know, and people are reconsidering, you know, is, can there be non-monogamy and commitment and love and as many gay marriages have proved to be the case, you know, it's strengthened many marriages. Uh, what does it mean to be an equal partner and not have to feel that male thing of like, I've got to, I've got to make more money and, you know, than you and, uh, so all of these things are being expanded, at least in the, in the West, you know, in the industrialized world. Um, so those are things that peop some people panicked about, right? Oh, we're, we, we, we don't want to be like uh, the monoculture. But I, I have found that, yes, there's more, uh, there's more gay uh, conservatives. So, you know, to me, I, I find, you know, a kind of, pulling back from rationality, you know, in the recent Republican Party. Uh, I used to have many, you know, Republican friends of my parents who were just very lovely people, and they've been sort of trained to, by whoever, to, you know, I don't know what Catholicism has to do with global warming, but now, you know, my, my parents were, were taught that there is no global warming by Fox News, and that is part of being a conservative, when really her main priority was was uh, abortion and taking care of you know the poor, which were you know Catholic priorities, and suddenly low taxes and uh, no global warming were on the docket, and that comes from a kind of uh, consolidation that came out of things like Fox News, which is rich people telling poor people what is good for them. Uh, I wondered if we were going to talk politics today. <laughs> I guess my answer has been, uh, has been provided. <laughs> yeah. Let's take one more before we wrap up. Thank you. It has to do with this Catholic background. I think you and I share a uh, high school in common in Albuquerque, am I right? St. Um, Pius? St. Pius, yeah. Oh, wow. And um, I'm fascinated by that because it's my experience of your uh, 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 sexual identity and mine that we went through this Catholic high school yeah. together. But I want you to speak a little bit more and about... How, can, uh, were you there in the 70s? 78. Or? Class of 78. Yeah, that's... I was a class of 81, and you know, the school had a, a strange kind of looseness That's about it, what didn't I want it? you to talk about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there were gay priests that were open. I know it, and they don't. How did that inform what you do? And tell me the positives and the negatives. Well, I came up in the Catholicism of the, of the Godspell era. You know, it was like right. guitars and Jesus, and, and my aunt is a nun, and she's my hero. You know, she's in her 80s. She's a very liberal nun. She's the kind of nun that's the environmentalist and who says, Johnny, when you get married to a, a man, I will be upset if I do not officiate. You know, and she's 86 uh, in, in Pennsylvania, and she's just my hero. Yep. She's my hero. She's the kind of nun that would, you know, would get shot in Central America in the 80s. You know, it was like she is a hero of mine. Uh, and that kind of Catholicism, the activists helping out the people who are in, in trouble, pro-immigration, pro-mercy, anti-capital punishment. Abortion is a personal choice. It has to be, you know. But she used to sign her emails with, the ultimate pro-life gesture is care of the earth, you know. And that is the kind of Catholicism that I still resonate with. And the idea of Jesus as a kind of, well, some would say cult leader, but others would say a kind of a socialist in a way. It's like share what you've got. And this all goes back to the question. It all goes back to what you saw and heard and learned at St. Pius. At St. Pius from very cool teachers, um, though I do remember an openly gay teacher being you know, kicked out because he was openly gay. Um, <laughs> as if that's, it's just so silly. But there was a wonderful, uh, you know, ferment at that time, which kind of got shut down in the 80s with a more conservative, uh, back, in my view, backwards looking view of Christianity and politics, uh, which was less about let's help people up and more about uh, kind of Ayn Rand. Mm -hmm. you're, if, if you're, you know, if you're a, a strong go ahead person, uh, you deserve a lot more than people who are helpless. Those people. Yeah. That, that's their own problem, which I find repulsive, you know, and I'm, I, would, I would say I'd call myself a, you know, 
an democratic socialist, you know, incentive-based socialist. One of my stories that I'm working on is about a, a circus that is dying out, and they're about to be raided by ICE, and they declare their fairgrounds an independent nation. Sanctuary circus. Uh, yeah, right? and they're all, you know, circus is very diverse politically. You know, they're all from el everywhere. Right. So they're not, it's not like hippies getting together or right-wing survivalists. And this is a story you're working on for? Well, it's, it's on my own right now. Interesting. Yeah. So that's something that... Uh, it's very much of the moment, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's thinking about what's next for America. Yeah. Um, I tend to be more... One of the things that wasn't mentioned in the, in the tragedy of northern Syria and, 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 and Trump letting the Turks, in effect, destroy our allies, the Kurds, who defeated ISIS in North Syria for I don't know what. He was just another bully that he liked. I, I don't really understand the, 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 the reasoning there. But the Syrian Kurds were creating a, what they called a communalist society, which was super feminist. In the Middle East, it was unheard of, uh, based on this theorist named Murray Bookchin, who was an ecological anarchist in the 70s here. So the leader of the Kurds, who's in jail in Turkey, sent this these books out to all of his people. And each village, a Kurdish village, is autonomous. Each has a co-female and male mayor. And all of their legislative bodies are, have to be at least 40% of one gender or another. The military is integrated. Uh, yep. It's complete freedom of religion. It was an experiment in localized, autonomous, almost anarchist democracy. Uh, and it was destroyed in a, in a week by the Turks and by Assad and the Russians uh, with the help of, of Trump. You know, and it's like people weren't mentioning that experiment. But I, I don't think most people know about that. Well, they didn't know about their, right. their anarchist experiments that were very, right. especially for the Middle East. Yeah. Were You're a pretty fascinating guy, I have to say. Uh, we, <laughs> we talked about some things today that coming in the door, I'll say, I didn't expect we yeah, talked about. You should it. have his daughter, uh, Debbie Bookchin, would travel to well, Chris, Debbie, should have her Debbie on. Bookchin is in Austin, Texas. We will have Debbie Bookchin on the show. Uh, please give John Cameron Mitchell a Thank you. Come back and see him on February 7th. Thank you all very much. <laughs>